And now our conversation with former FBI Acting Director Andrew McCabe. First, some background on the man who directed the FBI to investigate President Trump. As you know, Senator. Andrew McCabe was thrust into the spotlight and before the Senate Intelligence Committee in May 2017. Two days earlier, President Trump had fired FBI Director James Comey, making his deputy, McCabe, the acting FBI chief. He pledged support for the Bureau's Russia investigation he now oversaw. You cannot stop the men and women of the FBI from doing the right thing, protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution. The same day McCabe testified, President Trump told NBC News he fired Comey in part because of the Bureau's probe into the Trump campaign's ties with Russia. This Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made-up story. It's in his book, The Threat, McCabe says the FBI then launched a counterintelligence investigation into the president. Is there an inappropriate relationship, a connection between this president and our most fearsome enemy, the government of Russia? McCabe said this week he told the so-called Gang of Eight congressional leaders, including Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, then House Speaker Paul Ryan, and their Democratic counterparts about the investigation at the time. No one objected, not on legal grounds, not on constitutional grounds, and not based on the facts. The investigation was eventually taken over by special counsel Robert Mueller, who was appointed eight days after Comey was fired. Over the summer of 2017, President Trump repeatedly accused McCabe of a conflict of interest. McCabe's wife, Jill, had run unsuccessfully two years earlier for a Virginia state Senate seat and had received donations from a Hillary Clinton ally. McCabe himself had overseen the investigation into former Secretary Clinton's use of a private email server, but not while his wife was running for office. Then, in March 2018, just days before his retirement, McCabe was fired for allegedly lying to federal investigators about improper media disclosures unrelated to the Russia probe. McCabe contends he did nothing wrong and that his firing was retaliation for the investigation into the president. And Andrew McCabe joins us now. Welcome to the News Hour. So your book is titled The Threat, How the FBI Protects America in the Age of Terror and Trump. Is one more of a threat than the other? Well, I think they're both uh, significant issues that the FBI is, is, uh, um, has to confront uh, in this modern age. I think terrorism is a threat that we have grown to in the post 9-11 world. We've um, very much modified the way that we approach uh, um, our role in counterterrorism investigations and how we mitigate the threats posed by terrorists. I think the FBI is now uh, going through that same sort of adaptation to understanding how to work uh, in this era under a Trump administration. Well, as we sit here, and I'm sure you know, there's increasing speculation that the Mueller report is just about to be finished, transmitted to the Department of Justice. Based on everything you know, do you think the president could well be implicated in it? Well, it's hard to imagine a report that doesn't talk about the president, obviously. Um, of course, I don't know what will be in the report. I have incredible faith in uh, Director Mueller and his team's abilities to deliver honestly and independently the results that they've, that they've come to. And you've said you'll accept what the findings are, even if the president's exonerated. Absolutely. Absolutely. But again, based on what you know, do you think it's more likely the president's implicated under the heading of collusion coordination with the Russians? or under obstruction of justice? Mm -hmm. Well, Judy, I don't know that I could um, identify kind of a likelihood of either result. I can tell you that we were concerned about both in May of 2017 when we initiated the case on the president as a part of the overall investigation into Russian connections with his campaign. Um, I think some of the information that we're all aware of now that's been publicly uh, disclosed is, is highly concerning. Uh, the, the sheer number of interactions and contacts between uh, folks in and around this administration and people connected to Russian intelligence is truly remarkable. It's not like anything I've ever seen before. Um, 
you know, additional people trying to uh, affirmatively uh, conceal or, or lie about those contacts and through the course of the investigation is something that, that uh, should also give us pause. It came across pointedly in the book at one point. You said, in, you said in your last days at the FBI, you had been investigating the Russian government's interference in the 2016 election, possibly with the knowledge and involvement of that election's winning candidate. You didn't say campaign. You said candidate. That's right. You know, that was the, our decision in May, was that we felt we were at the point where we had to focus our investigated, investigative efforts on the president himself, not just on the campaign, which we had been doing that work since the end of the summer of 20, uh, 2016, but it was time to start looking in earnest at the president himself. So in connection with all this, we know that only hours after that infamous uh, Access Hollywood tapes were released. That was October of 2016, just hours after that. There was a huge leak of damaging emails about uh, Hillary Clinton from Hillary Clinton and from her then campaign manager, John Podesta, which had been stolen by WikiLeaks. Do you think right. that was a coincidence? It's hard to say. Um, I will say this, though. It is, it's extraordinary the number of events just like that that we now know about. You look back over the course of that period of time, it, I think as those events add up, it becomes harder and harder to explain them as sheer coincidence or, you know, um, unrelated events. Um, the president's own um, calls to the Russians to find the emails and, and continue, you know, uh, find, to find Hillary Clinton's emails and the now activity that R uh, Director Mueller's team has exposed of Russian intelligence um, individuals doing exactly that. I mean, these things are so close in time. They seem to be responding to each other. We don't know that for a fact, but it's, it's truly curious. You do write extensively in the book, uh, Andrew McCabe, about after you became the acting director of the FBI, after the president had, had fired James Comey, that the president was aggressively seeking assurances of personal loyalty from you. And you also write, he is the most prolific liar you've ever encountered. That's saying something from somebody like you who spent your career dealing with notorious criminals and terrorists. It is. Uh, it's remarkable. It's the kind of thing I think that people should think about more often as they, as they reassess and evaluate where we are as a nation. The fact that the president himself stands before this country on a daily basis and says things that, that many of us know are not true is just, um, I don't remember ever living through a time like this. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's just incredible. Of course, he calls you a liar he and, does. and is, has been very, very tough on you. He does. As recently as yesterday, the president gave, um, you know, made remarks to the press yesterday where he continues to perpetuate this false narrative about me, about my wife, about her campaign for state senate in Virginia in 2015. Um, you know, it's, it's sad. Uh, that we have, as a family, um, had to in, not just endure these attacks, but we are starting to expect them. Um, and that's a truly sad commentary on the state of the presidency. You've described how deeply concerned people were inside the FBI after Director Comey was fired, even conversations about whether the president could be removed from office. Um, the Wall Street Journal editorial board wrote this week uh, about what they call elites in Washington who far overreacted after President firing James Comey. And I'm quoting, they said, this elite panic was a bigger threat to constitutional norms than anything Mr. Trump is known to have done. Well, they're certainly entitled to their opinion. I see it very differently. Um, as the acting director of the FBI, the person responsible for the investigators, my responsibility at that time was to determine what the investigators should be doing. And the FBI's guidelines given to us by the Attorney General are very clear. When we have an articulable basis to believe that there may have been a federal crime committed or there may be a threat to national security, we are obligated to investigate, whether that's the President of the United States or your next door neighbor or anybody else. We don't investigate because we like someone or don't like someone or because they are in one direction or the other on the political spectrum. We investigate because the information in our possession 
calls us to do so. And that's what we did in May of 2017. Another question for you. Former Chairman of the House Overs Congressional Oversight Committee, Trey Gowdy, uh, is this week criticizing you for revealing uh, that May 2017 briefing of the so-called Gang of Eight congressional leaders about the fact that you had opened investigation into President Trump. You said that in that briefing, the Republican leaders in the meeting didn't raise concerns, but Mr. Gowdy is saying you know that congressional leaders just cannot talk about classified briefings like that. So you've been able to put your version of what happened out there. They're not able to respond. Well, I'm I think that there's already been discussion of that briefing. Um, mentions of that briefing have already been in the public sphere. Uh, so I'm not, and I, you know, I've many years of, of uh, interacting with leaders on the Hill and all kinds of different committees. You know, my experience has not been that that they are reluctant to discuss their business. But nevertheless, um, I have simply related my experience. Um, and the, my observations. And to be clear, it wasn't just that the Republicans didn't ask questions and the Democrats did. It was that the Deputy Attorney General and I convened the group, provided an extensive, detailed briefing of the status of our case, and we did not receive any questions or pushback or resistance or concern from any of the membership or staff in attendance about the steps that we had taken. And you're saying that they should be able to speak about it? No, I'm saying that if uh, that was the reaction I would, respect, I would expect from people who thought that we had done the reasonable and necessary thing. That's what I took away from the briefing, that nobody objected because we had taken a step that was clearly called for by the facts in our possession at that time. Last thing I want to ask you about is your firing from the FBI. Sure. The inspector general uh, said uh, in so many words that you were not candid. You didn't tell the truth on a number of uh, different exchanges uh, with, uh, with the inspector general's office uh, about sharing information with the news media. Um, your attorney said today that the investigation into all this is still underway. Um, and I think the question is, why is this investigation still underway? Who's doing this investigation? Where does this stand? I know you've disputed that version of events, but the fact that it's still going on, help us understand what's happening. Well, it's um, maybe a little bit more nuanced than that. At the conclusion of their investigation, the uh, Office of Inspector General referred the matter to the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office for investigation, and that's where um, it's still being pursued. Um, so that's what my lawyer was referring to, I think, in those comments. Um, you know, it's, they, they are, whatever work they're doing continues. Um, my attorneys are in, are in frequent and regular contact with them. I really can't say much more about it. And you, you've said you plan to sue the Justice Department. Well, I, I, I will. I'll bring a civil action against the department challenging the circumstances around my termination. Um, you know, Judy, I'll tell you that I have deep uh, um, disagreements, um, and I completely reject the conclusions drawn in that report. The Inspector General is well aware of this. We've, we've made our position clear to him in the, in the past. Um, I can tell you that at no time did I ever intentionally mislead anyone, not in his office and not in the FBI. Uh, I've been consistent about that. The, process that I was put through both during the investigation and after the conclusion of the report is not like anything I had ever seen in my time serving in the FBI. I had, you know, oversaw numerous matters that were handled, um, you know, uh, uh, investigations of, of alleged um, employee misconduct. Uh, so I will be challenging that process as well. Um, and finally, you know, I don't think it's a surprise to any of us that the result delivered by the Inspector General is exactly the one that the President was calling for publicly. A President who long before I had any interactions with the Attorney General, uh, with the uh, Inspector General's office, um, had made it clear both to Director Comey and to others that he wanted me gone. So when you add those circumstances together, all things ignored in, in the Inspector General's report, um, I think you'll see a very different side of things. 
Andrew McCabe. The book is The Threat, How the FBI Protects America in the Age of Terror and Trump. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy.